So I'm talking about anger management. Yep, uh, I may or may not be the uh, angry one in my household, depending on who you talk to. Um, but the problem with anger is that when you get angry, the blood leaves your brain, goes to your muscle groups, your IQ drops, and my kids are so smart that I can't afford to be angry because they will beat me every time in the intellectual debate, and that just makes you more angry and becomes a self-fulfilling problem. So uh, we're going to talk about anger today. We're going to talk about anger. Uh, and it's an interesting point we'll get to in the Sermon on the Mount. We've been going through the blessed life, the Sermon on the Mount, and we finished the first kind of fairly famous bit, the Beatitudes, And we come to now this section where Jesus starts to talk about really practical things like what does this look like to live this new life that Jesus is talking about? What does it look like to live it in your daily life? So there's lots and lots of practical things in the next few sermons, the next few sections of the Sermon on the Mount. But I was thinking about that for this week, a few thoughts popped into my head and I want to have you think about them a little bit as we go through today's passage. If we pay attention to Jesus' words, if we look at what he says and we try and do them, does being obedient to what Jesus says in here, does that make me a Christian? If I do the right things as he teaches us, if I do the right things the right way, does that make me right with God? Is this a super helpful outline of how to live my life and if I do that then me and God are all good because the answers to those questions really change how we see this passage so so we're going to try and go today we'll see how we go through that so as we get to uh, the Sermon on the Mount Matthew as he's preparing his his account of Jesus's life his gospel it's he's very clever Matthew he's very thoughtful he's very intentional and so Matthew if you, if you look at the bigger picture of what he's doing Uh, He's presenting Jesus, Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, who's coming to declare that he is both Christ, going to be king, and the Son of God. He's the new and better Moses. And if you are familiar with the Old Testament uh, passages on Moses, there's a lot of echoes of Moses' life that Matthew's portraying in Jesus. Going up a mountain and finding the law of God. Sounds familiar, right? Uh, Earlier in, in the story... Uh, the evil ruler trying to kill all the babies to get rid of this coming one. There's a lot of parallels between Moses and Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. But not just the new and better Moses. Jesus is the new and better king. And he's bringing with him a new kingdom. And he's setting it up. And it's a kingdom not like other kingdoms that we've seen. So there's lots and lots of parallels between Moses' life and Matthew's version of Jesus. And so... Uh, next week, you can submit your papers for extra credit as you review them, and we'll. No, there's no prize. Um, no, okay. The others are probably not going to be as good as that. Um, but so we get to the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew's kind of portrayal of Jesus' life. And so this is the new law, this is the new kind of uh, covenant that God is bringing to people. Jesus fulfilled the old one, and now he's extending a new one, kind of like Moses did on the mountain in Exodus. Again, so today, to make it really meaningful, we're going to spend a lot of time in Leviticus to understand the law. No, no. We'll do a class after that this afternoon if you'd like to come. No, no. Um, But there's new laws that Jesus is going to talk about from now right through, actually, to almost the end of the Sermon on the Mount. These new laws are actually setting up the way that the new kingdom works because when there's a new king, he wants to establish his rule. And that actually makes everything that he says quite different to how other things should be understood. It's not actually a list of things you should do and shouldn't do. He's actually talking about a new way of living where the new people who live in the new kingdom, the new place, the new um, covenant, actually live and relate to one another. You see, in the old, old setup, people belonged by obeying three different things. They had to obey special laws about food. They had to obey special laws about Sabbath, about rest days and holy days. And they had to obey special laws about circumcision. So if you did those things, they demonstrated to the people around you that you were a follower of this one true God. And so by Jesus' time, 
As Ian talked about last week, the scribes and Pharisees have got this down to a fine art. They have clarified and refined, and so instead of just going do and don't do these big things, they've got, I've got 613 special laws on my list to make sure I do it all right, which is admirable in a lot of ways. What these things were, were markers of the covenant. And this is, this is how the thinking went. I love God. This is what the true believers would have probably thought. I love God. He's, he's real, he's true, he's, he's changed my life. When I go to temple to worship, oh, I know that God is true and real. So because he's true and real, because in his wisdom and in his mercy, he's shown me how to live, I will respond by doing these things. And so I keep these seemingly fairly strict and stringent commandments because it's the overflow of my desire to belong to him. So I participate in his community and I live this way because this is what this community does. This is what Jesus came to be a part of. He stepped into this and he spends the first 30 years of his life living in this scenario. And he comes along and he says, great, you've done a good job, but let me say, I've done it right and there's going to be a new way of living now. And you can imagine how uncomfortable that would be for the people who are trying to do things right. Just everyday people trying to follow God and do it right. And all of a sudden, Jesus starts to talk about changing the rules. But that's the beautiful thing about how Jesus comes and changes the rules. See, it wasn't just before where God told people what to do. Now Jesus decides to come as God to be a person to show us how to do it well. And that's what this whole passage is going to start to introduce to us. As the new and better Moses with a new covenant and a new testament, there's going to be a new way of living. In the first sermon of this series, John kind of you know, previewed what this is all about. From a very important piece right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, right at the most significant piece, like the, the, the center point that it all rotates around. Jesus teaches the disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what Jesus is starting to outline now. You see, the good thing is that the, under the old way, you had to make sure you ate the right food, no bacon. You had to make sure you had the right days off, you couldn't change your shifts around. You had to make sure that you circumcised your baby boys at eight days old, otherwise they wouldn't be part of the, the, the covenant community. They wouldn't have the knowledge to pass on to the next generation that God has set aside his special people. Jesus comes, and as Paul unpacks in the rest of the New Testament, he says, no, 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 I've finished those things. I did them right. Now I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in, the, in you, each and every one of you, My presence is going to dwell in you, and that's going to be the marker of this new relationship, this new covenant, this new kingdom. It's gone from what you do on the outside that makes you belong to who lives on the inside of you that makes you belong. What's on the inside and who's on the inside is actually the most important thing. Because it's very easy to get into these amazing lists of things we should and shouldn't do and think, oh, okay, I just have to manage my anger and then I'll belong. And God will be really, really pleased with me and I'll get my gold star and I'll get to go and be with him forever. So if we have to behave before we belong, then that's kind of like the old way. It's kind of about earning our way into God's good books, but Jesus is starting to paint a picture of the difference it makes when he lives on the inside of you. The key in all of this, and it's quite a subtle difference, is we do these things because we belong. We don't do these things so that we belong. It's a very subtle difference, but it makes all the difference. We do these things because we belong to him. We don't do these things in order to find a space to belong. So when Jesus comes to what he's about to say, murder and anger, we're thinking, well, it's good, I don't murder, this is easy, I belong. Oh, but Jesus changes the conversation. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. 
I'm going to jump into verse 21. So Jesus has just talked about the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees and unless you're more righteous than them, you'll never enter the kingdom and everyone around is like, those guys are pretty righteous. We're in a lot of trouble. If they weren't already worried, Jesus ups the ante. Verse 21, you have heard it said to those, you heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother or sister is liable, to, is liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Right. That doesn't sound like any fun at all, does it? Everyone's right? like, okay. Anyone read that and go, uh-oh. Or is that just me? Okay, me and Josh, there's a few of us, okay. Uh-oh, uh-oh, I've stumbled at the first hurdle. <laughs> I want to be blessed, I want to be poor in spirit, and I want to be salt and light, so don't be angry. Oh, no. Uh, we had many discussions about how I could do like an object lesson and thought about kicking things over or <laughs> slapping Pastor Ian and calling him a, a fool, but uh, we decided not to do that. Because I don't want to, I don't want to risk myself in the fires of hell. So, uh, what's Jesus talking about here? Why does he do this? Why does he, he take what seems like a fairly easy to keep law? Don't murder people. Yeah, okay. Most of us have got that down. Why does he then change the rules and start to push it inside and to start upping the requirement of what's going on in our hearts and in our minds? Well, it's interesting. Jesus is actually saying something pretty controversial here. When he says, you've heard it said to the people of old, he actually then quotes the sixth commandment from the Ten Commandments, from the law of Moses. He directly quotes it, and then uh, and when he talks about you'll be liable of judgment, he essentially wraps up all of Leviticus' views on what happens when you murder someone or even uh, if there's manslaughter. He says, you've heard it said. But then, quite controversially, I think, he says, but... I tell you. And I know what I mean when I say but in my family. Yeah, that's all fine and dandy, but I'm going to disagree with you now. So when Jesus quotes the law, the Old Testament, and says, but I tell you, everyone's like, everyone just step away because the lightning might strike any second. Now, who does this guy think he is? Like, he, he can't change God's laws. What do you think, he's God or something? No wonder he creates quite the stir. He actually kind of contradicts or actually takes it further. He starts to go, what happens inside you is actually the same. But this makes sense. This would have actually made sense to a whole bunch of people who were listening because they remembered this, this prophet Jeremiah hundreds and hundreds of years beforehand who, who actually kind of warned them really in a positive sense. He said, uh, the day is coming, he says this in chapter 31, the day is coming where I'll put, uh, I'll put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. It's Jesus is like, you know, uh, it happens regularly for here. The laws will change on this date and then things that were legal or illegal will change. It's like Jeremiah said, the laws will change. What you think happens on the outside, it's going to happen on the inside. And Jesus says, okay, today's the day. There's a new king in town. It makes it pretty clear that the, the outside is only part of the problem. And what's happening inside starts to be really the important thing. This new way of living is not an outside-in way of living. It's an inside-out way of living. And it's interesting that he starts with the sixth commandment. And of course, you all know the first five. The first five are about God and us, and then one about really your close family. This is the first commandment that actually deals with what it looks like to live in community. So Jesus is really, really starting to kind of poke people, going, hey, this, this new way of living, it's a, it's, a, it's a God and you, but it's a God and us way of living. And how we do this together makes all the difference. Which I actually think, no surprise, because God is God and God knows what he's doing. 
It's probably not much more timely a message for us in our day and age about what anger looks like in the community. Without being too pop culture-y, it's not hard to see around us constantly what anger looks like expressed to one another. We get angry across racial divides and gender divides. We get, we get angry across uh, political divides and socioeconomic divides. We get angry across geographic divides. Who does, you know, the 407, oh, people are fighting with the 407. Three people, you know, it's like, it's like turf wars. As soon as you get into those, those Facebook groups, man alive, what's going on in there? If you've ever had to post, what kind of snake is this? Anger flies up. But it's, it's, it's an epidemic. Anger is an ec- epidemic. Anger just overflows. I can't, I can't be in relationship with you because you disagree with me and I'm angry about that. And I'd like to say that it doesn't happen in the covenant people of God, but I think maybe we all know that sometimes it does. See, the difference now is we have a platform and a medium to share our anger with anyone who'll listen. And it starts to find a resonance. And it starts to build. And it starts to become a significant problem. And when Jesus says, oh, what's happening in your heart? Whoa. See, I didn't murder anyone, but man, I thought about how much I don't like that person when they wrote that thing, or they said that thing when they did that to me or my friend. But what difference would it make to the community that God has planted us in, to the community that God has planted you in, if instead of responding in anger, there was a different response? Because it's quite confusing, actually, right? If you read all through the New Testament, Jesus is pretty clear, don't be angry, right? Because essentially you're murdering someone in your heart. This is how I grew up thinking about it. Don't do that, that's bad. I'm like, oh, goodness, please, Lord, don't let me get angry. But then, Jesus gets super angry at one particular point in his ministry, right? Like flipping tables. Like he made a whip and whipped people who were disobeying God's rules. So I'm like, okay, Jesus, why is there two, why is there two sets of rules here? Why do you get to do one and we can't do that? Like, that doesn't seem fair, right? And then when Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4... Don't sin in your anger. I'm like, but well, Jesus kind of made it sound like any anger is sin. This is a little, like, I remember being a kid in church going, I just want to get it right, and you're making it really hard. Right? Is it just me? Just me. I just don't know how to get this right. And so, I, in fact, I was still, I'm still wrestling with this. If you came for an answer, sorry. No, no. Where I've come to so far, and as I've read and as I've reflected, It seems like that there's a difference between when God stirs up something in our hearts, when we see God's best, be it people, be it ways of living, be it his own name and honour, when when we see the things of God and his kingdom and his people attacked and threatened, there rises up in us an appropriate response. If that is not okay, that shan't stand. It's like Gandalf, bang. Not on my watch. An indignation at the the things that war against relationship and the kingdom. But when it becomes then my fleshly issue, ooh, I've stepped over a line. So to break it down, when anger drives me to God and relationship, good. When anger drives me towards murderous thoughts and murder, bad. That's where I'm at so far. So you can't have something practical in this message. <laughs> That's what I think Jesus is getting at here. He's starting to, to, to rise up within us this awareness that every single person we interact with is a person who's made in God's image, who is, who is actually created to reflect who he is. And they may not yet. You might be here today going, what is this guy talking about? I don't know what's going on. The good news is you're made with a purpose. You're made with meaning. There's a reason that you're alive, and it's not just to take up space. 
And so when we start warring against each other and we start having these thoughts in our heart, we're actually going, God, you made something that I don't don't like it. I wish that thing, that person, that one you made with unique calling and purpose wasn't here. And that's what Jesus is saying. This is, this is an issue. Depending on your translation, uh, it uses some interesting language. It says, uh, Jesus says, if you, if you call someone Raka, if you say to them Raka, which means you empty-headed buffoon, which is great, that's a great phrase. Sounds like when we're watching Tribal Council and Survivor in my family. <laughs> you buffoon, why would you do that? Jesus, don't, don't call people that. That's a problem. Someone that I made just saying there's no worth in them. That's not good. It's going to get you up in front of the authorities. And he doubles down. Everyone's thinking, man, I've been in jail already. He doubles down and says, you call someone a fool. In fact, the Greek word here is where we get our word moron from. <laughs> he says, oh, that's, that's, that's the fires of hell. That's eternal punishment. It's like, oh. What Jesus is, I think, and, and, and it happens the whole way through, he's essentially setting an unattainable level. Be more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees. Never, never even think the slightest negative thing in your heart as we get into the next sections, all sorts of things. Don't do this. You can't do that. If you do this, you're in a world of hurt. He's setting an impossible standard because he's got a solution. But until we realize we can't do it in our own strength, we won't seek the solution. And I think it matters because Jesus is setting up this new way to live. And he has to make it clear. He has to make it clear. He has to say, there is a new way to live. And, and this is the, the good part for us. The people on the day where he preached this, they didn't know how the story was going to end. They didn't know that the, the events of the, the resurrection after the crucifixion, the first Easter, they didn't know that was going to happen. They didn't know that what Jesus was doing was inaugurating, starting a new kingdom that would be centered around his actual personal presence with each and every one of us. They didn't know. They're thinking, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. But we have the benefit of hindsight. Matthew's writing this after the events of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and took up residence in everyone who said that Jesus was Lord and Jesus knew that his personal presence in us is the thing, the one who's going to help us live different. Because the Holy Spirit's never going to say Raka to someone else created in the image of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't see someone else and go, they're a moron. The Holy Spirit says, oh, that person's made in my image. They're so precious to me. Oh, ask me about them. I'll tell you all about how much I love them. Oh, this person's amazing. Let me tell you what they're like. We call it prophecy. It's just God talking about how much his kids are awesome. Jesus desires a community that comes together and strengthens itself in him, not tears itself apart. Because remember, behavior doesn't get us into the kingdom. Jesus does. Our behavior is the result of him getting us in, of us belonging because of him. Our behavior is not our ticket in. Some of you are like, that's devastating. The rest of us are like, phew, let me in. Jesus goes on, verse 23. So then, don't call anyone fool or empty-headed buffoon. So then, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with them to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you'll never get out until you've paid the last penny. What's inside matters 
and what's inside is not just. And this is a radical piece. His work in us isn't just to get us in. It's actually then to empower us to bring change to the people around us. So it's like, you know, um, I'm sure I read this growing up differently. It's like, if, if you're upset with someone, go and tell them and then say sorry. Which is such a good way to blow up a church. I just need to go and just, I just want to tell you that I've been so mad at you for so long, but I've forgiven you now. Like, that's not a good way to create community, right? Don't do that, please. But if you know someone's not happy with you, seek them out. Love them. Reconcile with them. Seek to build relationship back. See, Jesus changes it, goes even deeper. Oh, you might be actually doing fine. You've not thought anyone's a moron. But if someone thinks you're a moron, you, you need to go find them. You need to go and build relationship. You need to go and invest in that and let them know that there's a better way of living and we do this better when we're together because Jesus calls us part of his community. And, and not just the people around you that are like you, even the ones who, wanna, who destroy you, who want to take you to court. Deal with it on the way. Show what it looks like to be a people of the new kingdom because there's a new king. The new king sets a new way of living and he invites us all to be a part of it. It's as if when we are part of his kingdom, there's enough resource in us and in ourselves because of his presence in us that we don't need to worry about this stuff. We can be the generous ones. He makes us proactive in dealing with anger. It's not just reactive internally, but proactive in the community. He's setting up a new way of living. So anger management probably isn't the right phrase to use. It's actually relationship management. It's actually managing your closeness to him. I thought about, like, what's, what, how do I wrap this up? And I had the phrase, don't be bad mad. But it's more than that. It's how do we lean in to the places where relationship needs to be strengthened? How do we lean into places where it's hard and uncomfortable because God's got something glorious in that moment? How do we, how do we sing the songs that we sung this morning? Bless God in the sanctuary. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Bless him when everything's hard. How do we go, okay, and now I'm going to take that blessing and invest it in another relationship? I'm thinking, I don't know how to do that. But then I thought, you know what? Jesus shows us right through through, his, through Matthew's gospel. Matthew's very clever. There's almost nothing that happens here that Jesus doesn't actually have to demonstrate in his own life in the worst of circumstances. He just said, just a few verses before, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, who utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. And then... And a short while in Jesus' life, he's brought on trial and falsely accused. People had all sorts of blasphemies about him. He has to live that out. He said, don't murder anyone, but don't even think about hating anyone. And if anyone's got reason to hate someone, it's when that, that Roman soldier is pounding a nail through your wrist, but he says there, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Like, Jesus had to do this. Jesus had to live it out. Jesus, on, on his way to the prison, to, to death, is making a way to reconcile things. He leaves the temple, he leaves the place of worship and goes out to bring the people back. It's not actually about what you can and can't do, it's about what he's already done and that changes us from the inside out. He didn't get mad. Actually, didn't even get even. He turned the other cheek, he laid down his life because he knew that when the Father raised him to life by the power of the Spirit in his own authority, that that would be overcome and he would come and dwell in each one of us. And so anger now isn't our only option.
Jesus lives out the heart of the Sermon on the Mount throughout his entire life. He is the living demonstration of it. And so we don't have a king who's unfamiliar with sorrow and suffering. We don't have a king who actually makes unattainable stands. We have a king who says, I'll look after this for you, just come be with me. And so the challenge today is not, how do I manage my anger? The challenge today is how close am I to the Prince of Peace? How close am I to the Spirit who is marked by patience and gentleness? How close am I to Him because He is the one who enables me to love? So I'm going to ask you um, just to stand up. If that's okay, we're going to wrap this up now. I want to pray for you. I'd love you just to bow your, your heads and maybe close your eyes. And I want to ask you a question and then I want to lead you through just a simple prayer response for you. And we'll open it up for more prayer afterwards. And I believe the Lord wants to just step in and bring healing into bodies and minds and hearts today as well. Would you just close your eyes and in fact, guys, can you just dim the lights just a little bit if you're watching online? You can just, uh, just close your eyes so you're not distracted by what's going on around you. I don't want you to answer these out loud. I just want you to just mark your own response in a prayerful way. So I want to ask you, is the dwelling place of God on the inside of you? Does the Holy Spirit live in your life? How close are you in relation to Him today? When's the last time you spent time with Him? What are the blockages or barriers that are in your life, in your heart, in your mind that are stopping that relationship. Because depending on the answers to those questions, I believe he just wants to, to make an exchange with you today. And in the goodness of God, as we were praying pre-service, someone prayed right into this and I thought, oh Lord, that's what you're doing today. That's what you're doing today. So I want to just pray with us. I want to lead you in a prayer. You have to pray this out loud. You can pray it in your heart. But I just encourage you today that if this is you, we want to exchange that anger for what God has for us. So Lord, Lord the anger in my life, I can picture it like a heavy backpack the frustration and the annoyance and the hurt in my heart that makes me angry at other people. It's like a, a backpack full of rocks, Lord. I just want you to imagine that if that's you today, just to be aware of the toll that it takes on you to carry anger. But today, if you're willing, Jesus wants to exchange that with you. Just in your mind's eye, you can imagine yourself just taking it off, but you can pray this prayer alongside. God, to take this anger off my life because it's not true of me, because it's not true of you. So Lord, I want to hand you my anger today. I hand you this, this bag of frustration, hurt, distrust, all these things that get in the way of relationship, I hand them to you today, Lord Jesus. And now with empty hands, Lord, what do you have in exchange for me? I just want you to ask him and just let him speak to you in this moment about what he has for you.
So Lord Jesus, as we make this exchange with you, we give you permission to come fill us afresh. By your Holy Spirit, would you come flood into our bodies right now afresh, into our hearts and into our minds and in spaces where anger was, Lord, we give you permission now to come and be Lord, be King over those parts. Would you come? Would you come, Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, would you come fill us afresh? Thank you that your burden is easy and your yoke is light, that you empower us to forgive, to release, to reconcile. Would you come have your way in us today as we worship, as we lift your name on.